Welcome everyone to another edition of the AWS Blogger. My name is John Meyer and I'm bringing you part two. And last week in part one series with PTP, we had, I hate my AWS bill. How do I reduce it? And if you missed it, don't worry about it. I'll just drop the link below in the chat. Why, you know what? Let me introduce the guy and let's get right to it. All right, I'd like to introduce Senior Solutions Architect from PTP, Aaron Jeske. Aaron, how are you? Doing very well, John. Thanks for having me back. Glad to be yeah, here. Yeah, let me uh, get you over here. Sorry, I got to multitask yeah. here and uh, switch some scenes around, bring you in, do, you know, the, all the fun stuff you taught me a couple months ago. Well, if you, keep on, if you keep on growing your audience like you have been, you'll have a producer in no time. <laughs> I wonder if there's a role open for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> all right. So, you know, Aaron, what are we talking about today? You have to remind me, John. I was ready for anything except for that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got you. You know what? I, I put a spin on it. Normally, I do the introduction of you know what we're talking about, but this is unscripted. I've got some questions, but other than that, clearly, right now, it's I have a bunch of fun. <laughs> After that response, it's clearly unscripted. Yeah. All right. So. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love all the natural stuff. All right. So we're, we're, wait, we're talking about, oh, I have all this data. How do I move it to AWS? Are you ready oh, for that's... that part of the discussion? <laughs> you mean what we were spitballing about before we joined the call and then it just completely fell out of my brain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all right. Um, so to let everybody know, I am monitoring YouTube and Twitch for some chat, mostly YouTube. Drop your questions in there. You can drop some questions to Aaron, like what are we talking about today? We'll <laughs> see if he can answer them live. Uh, uh, you can ask him about his hair if you want. Yep. Uh, you know what? Don't ask him what the weather is like uh, up there. So, you know, it's probably cold and rainy like it is here. Yep. Snow, snow for Halloween. Yeah, I heard that. Uh, supposedly Friday I might get some, so I'm not looking for that one. But, ah, uh, so anyway, uh, let's get right to some of the questions. What do you got? Oh, I was going to say, let's, uh, so where do you want to go first? Do we want to talk about getting, getting data <laughs> as quickly as possible? I want to uh, I want to ask you what we're supposed to be talking about here. Oh, so today we're talking about data migrations into AWS. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So last week we had that in-depth in discussion about our AWS bill on cost savings and analysis and, you know, really where we can do something. Here we're going to get a little more specific is, you know, we have all this data. And when I say we have all this data, we're not talking about five or six gigs of data. We're talking about five or 600 gigs, petabytes, whatever it is. Let's just jump right into it. So Aaron, I have all this data. What's the first thing I should do? Or what are some things I can do besides copy and paste in the S3 and you know move it around? So it's funny, uh, This a lot of these services were just beginning when I was working for a video delivery company uh, that you, you've worked very close with as well. Um, you know, and uh, when we had about 16 petabytes sitting in a data center uh, in, in uh, just north of Boston here um, and sitting on 5,400 RPM disks that were very quickly approaching eight or nine years old. So the, the, the panic to get that much data out was quite real. So now looking at the, ser the the service catalog that Amazon offers to move that kind of data, I am so jealous of the people that get to do that. I, um, I lived some real pain. This was a, you know, Direct Connect was just barely a thing at the time. Um, and we were, uh, you know, we were doing all this over the public internet. It was real atrocious. But today, um, you know, we, we've migrated here at uh, PTP. We've um, we've done everything from a, a snowball to uh, you know, multiple snowballs uh, uh, configured together. I haven't had the opportunity to do a snowmobile, but that that's that sounds pretty awesome. I would have loved you know eight nine years ago for just a tractor trailer truck to show up, and I totally would have clicked the little box that says "Have armed guards come" because I <laughs> think that would just be awesome to have you know have a whole like SWAT team of guys show up with all this uh, with all this storage. Um, so, you know, you, you have, uh, you do have a bunch of options for migration, um, when you have that just, you know, massive amounts, but that's not always, you know, let's be honest, there are not that many folks that are going to run into that type of situation. Sure. The, you know, it's, uh, what's a snowball now? 68 local, I think somewhere around there, uh, for, for an individual, um, 
So you know you, that's that's, that's going to cover a lot of your standard offices if you want to do that. But you know, I think the the the, the real worry that I I get into is you know that that couple terabyte where maybe you don't always have you know the 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 port capacity or anything like that. So you know, there's also a, a bunch of tools that you can use, uh, you know, server migration tools and uh, data migration tools as well. But um, that's kind of the, the the rough edges of the catalog from all the way from a snowball a, a, a tractor trailer truck filled with hard drives. Through an array of, I always think that remember back in the '80s we had those little coolers at the soccer games where you get all the hot chocolate from. I feel like yeah. they, that's what those that's what it's, the snowball. Oh, kind of I know like. what you're talking about. You're talking you're, you're you're talking about like the big events where when you go to a conference, right? Yeah. They yeah. have the coffee and yes. all that. <laughs> that yeah yeah yeah. It's that's like, what it looks like. They hollowed it out, threw a whole bunch of hard drives in there, and uh, and turned it into a really great data migration service. So you know, and you can run that in parallel with multiple units. Um, you can you know run it as a single unit there, um, but I think you know a lot of people are going to run into you know how do how do I move data really quickly um, just over the wire? I think that's you know biggest. It's the kind of the gambit of everything we bumped into. All right, so I got a couple comments here for you. First of all, if those containers can hold that coffee nice and hot, I'm sure they can hold some of the storage. By the way, yes. Yep, absolutely. All just right, wait, empty them out before you throw the hard drives in. Wait, they're not waterproof. <laughs> <laughs> wait, so wait, is there, is there really a checkbox for arm guards? Yeah, there really is. Yeah. I did not even know. Yeah, that. First of all, I've never ordered one. I never yeah. really <laughs> I've, I've, I've gone to the, gone to the page and I've been hovering over the button like I really just just to see what happens. Can I uh, expense that? Yeah, exactly. If you got an Amex black card, I think you can. Oh, uh, uh, well, you know, <laughs> probably. <laughs> By the way, I am licensed to drive those trucks. Just a side note. Oh, if you, you want are, one, I'll bring it. <laughs> You have a CDL? Yes, I do. Lo previous life, long story. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know, when you worked for a small IT company back then that was also a beverage company at the same time, they needed help delivering products. So <laughs> I helped and then came and did my regular job. <laughs> I uh, my, my first IT job working for a small ISP in Central Mass was uh, I learned to ride a unicycle my first week there. So, you know, the, the skills we pick up at work. <laughs> Wait, was that a requirement? <laughs> the owner said, I don't know what to do with you yet. Here's a unicycle. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, all right. We're, I know we're way off topic. Right, way off topic this, but this is a fun part of it. Uh, so let, let, let me jump right in there. Uh, are there some things that we should consider before taking any migration or data approaches here? You know, or should I just click the button and say, give me my armed guards and see ya? Yeah. Um, so, you know, one thing that you that you know, I think um, you know, we, we've talked about this many times, not just in, in last week's chat, uh, but you know, I've definitely expressed. You know, part of what I I find so valuable about the, the organization I work for, PTP, is that we have a we have a great group of network engineers with us. And you know, we as as cloud folks, we're, we're so used to sure. I just you know, I go in and I ask for a different IOPS. I just you know, I select a different instance type. I you know, I, I just move the slider, and all this networking magic happens in the background. Um, but when you're going from on-prem, you know, so if, if you're a cloud guy going trying to help out somebody that's on-prem, you maybe you haven't had that much experience, you know, port density, what types of ports that you're looking for, uh, you, you know, so you got QSFPs, you got SFPs, you got plain old, you know, uh, Cat5, what is the, the connectivity that you can possibly get and what are the requirements to try to get that, if, you know, we're, we should just use a snowball as, as an example because I think it's a more common use case that we're going to have here. So, you know, you've got the snowball, it shows up at your site, uh, you're ready to start moving your data over, you've got your migration scripts to talk to the talk to the device. Um, you know, you're all lined up from, uh, you know, a, a software deployment uh, standpoint, but getting the right data put through, your, you know, if your requirements are, we need to be able to get this 50 terabytes, 100 terabytes off, uh, you know, in the next 24 hours, how can you guarantee that? So having somebody around that has that skill set of or, or or you know doing your appropriate stack overflow searches um, to make sure you're you know you're you're putting out the right cabling essentially to get to uh, to that device you know it it comes back to the same exact thing I, I start off pretty much every cloud conversation with versus people say where do I start you start at your network <laughs> uh, and making sure that you have the right equipment and the right throughput to meet your, meet the, the requirements you know because if you're on a if you only got a ten base T half duplex or yeah, even worse, like a you know twin X connection <laughs> available on your network, and you're only pushing a few megabits a second. 
um, you know, you're, you're never going to be able to meet a lot of the requirements that you're going to be handed down to. So network, network, network is the very first thing I would go for. You mean my 56K modem won't work? No, you know, even if you bonded them together. Yeah. <laughs> we were just having this discussion the other day and I was hearing the dial up sound in my head. Yeah. My kids will never experience what that's like. I'm kind of actually disappointed. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's um, yeah, it's definitely I think it's something what you maybe that's why I, I always I push so hard towards network, 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 is I've lived through the days where the networks were so much worse <laughs> that I've just uh, you know, my my instinct is let's make sure the network's good. Um, and you know, also having uh, you know having a good understanding your network and your and your server side too, where you're where you're getting data from, you know, you're writing to a a, a single black backplane device here. Um, you know, you don't get the the niceties of writing directly to S3, where you're going to be writing to possibly you know your backend writes are going to be happening to dozens of nodes. Um, you know, you're writing to one backplane. So you know, IOPS of you know if you're moving hundreds of hundreds of thousands of tiny 1K, 2K files versus moving, you know, a couple of terabyte files, that's going to be a real big, uh, you know, it's going to be a huge difference of an experience when you're going to write the data, no matter, you know, no matter what, you know, what your network is, uh, your ability to open files, close files, validate all that stuff, that's going to be a real impact on you too. So knowing your data set is, this, is the next thing I would go for is understanding really, you know, what, what that means to your, your transmitting node and your receiving node there. So um, you know, if you got a whole bunch of little TIFF files from a fax scan, you know, from fax device from 20 years ago that you're having to, you're saying, you know, just get it up in the glacier. Well, we'll do it in a couple of hours. It's only 50 gigabytes of files. Yeah. Well, it's 50 gigabytes of one K files. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to take a couple of days. It's because, uh, you know, the backplane on the, on the server can't. That's interesting. I always thought about, uh, obviously, the network. How long is it going to take to transfer? Do you really need that data? Do you really need to move that data over? Now's the time to purge the data you don't need and get the data there and get your right uh, processes in place You know, for your storage. What type of storage are you going to need for these migrations? Whether they're, you know, think about it. Whether you're going to move this over to an EBS volume or you're going to go into S3, and then you're going to have, okay, what kind of policies are you going to have in place? How long do you need to retain this data? What level of encryption do you need for this data? And, you know, set all those policies up front, in my opinion. That way, when you move it over, you're not worried about it. You, you don't have to go in there and manage it, and you're constantly getting all that storage cost. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, you know, you're, you're going, kind of going down the tier here. Can, can I do the data transfer? You know, how I, or how, how do I even physically do the data transfer? How is it going to, you know, how is that project going to look to getting that data there? Now you have to start thinking about the, the next tier of this, the third tier is, uh, you know, what am I going to do with that data once it's in Amazon? You know, you brought up a really good point of, you know, EBS volumes. So, you know, you, you know if you're using a snowball, we're going to keep on that instance, you know, that type, you're going to boot, you're going to bring it up at S3 and you're going to pull it back down or, um, you know, or however you're going to, you know, get, once the data is in there, you're going to start moving it around. Um, you know, what are you going to do for right sizing your, your EBS volumes? Are you going to be, what, what do your IOPS look like there? You know, what, what does it now start to look like once you're in the cloud? So, yeah, so that's, that's your accessibility, your, your accessibility to the EBS volumes, you know, one scenario. But I think the scenario that's the most, most interesting, I think, and I see becoming so much more common, you know, PTP is a life science partner with AWS. So we've been having great fortune of working with a lot of really awesome therapeutics companies here in the Boston area, um, you know, uh, either finding them on our own, but, you know, the, the, cha the support channel at AWS helping introduce us because, you know, we, we are a smaller organization that has this great networking uh, uh, component to it, us and the, the strong AWS engineering. Uh, but so that's uh, what's really fun about working with those companies is so much of what I see their software doing now is not block level. You know, we're, we're, I'm seeing a huge transition to object level uh, file systems or and even if even if you are doing, um, you know, file creation, so much is now accessible through Athena. There's a lot of a lot of great tools, you know, for their business intelligence aspect of things where just getting it into S3, wrapping Athena around it and then, you know, shoving it off into their BI tool has been a real success. So the, uh, you know, the, the tiering capabilities of an object store really can help out a ton for um, for your ability to uh, you know to, to go and take on that cost savings measure you know start looking at uh, you know uh, intelligent tiering like I mentioned earlier you know if you've got 
a million, you know, 50 gigabytes of fax images from 20 years ago that somebody wants to keep because they're a data hoarder, throw it in Glacier, you know, that type of thing. But yeah, that, that tiering aspect of, of a block is becoming so much more important. You know, we have customers that are doing, you know, customers that don't have that big of a team. And um, one of the science teams I was working with the other day had five people on the team and, and they're trying to kick around about 400 terabyte. You know, and, and that's all that's all been moving from block to object. Now, I have. OK, as always, I have a couple things. So yeah. if anybody ever sees me writing down, I'm taking notes for Aaron <laughs> here to challenge him with my pop quiz uh, <laughs> going on there. I've already challenged him with the title of this one. <laughs> that was the biggest thumper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By the way, you said niciest. Is that a word? Is that a vo your vocabulary? Nah, niciest. I, th I think I just uh, I think I just. I'm uh, I'm from you know, Boston area. We just talk fast and yeah. not very well. Oh, it was perfect, Aaron. Don't worry about that one. Second, I gotta correct you on something because you said PTP is a small company. I, I really don't think you're a small company. And if you look at PTP and all the major stuff that you guys have done, you may be small, but you're able to accomplish these huge tasks with the resources you have in hand, whether in house or not. So I, I think you guys handle that great. You know. Niciest uh, yeah. for that. Niciest stuff. way we could. <laughs> yeah, the niciest <laughs> way you could. So don't shortchange you guys on now. Why they're yeah, a company, and if you get to work with Aaron, you it, that'll even be much better. So yeah, I think uh, you know where where I feel that a PTP is just not as uh, you know it doesn't have the huge employee backing numbers. When you're looking at the competition that we have in that life sciences area, there it's you know we're go we're we're one of the one of the first 13 or we're like the we were the 11th or 13th i forget exactly um uh partner to achieve the life sci life sciences competency where the other partners were just enormous you know 10 20 30 thousand employee consulting firms so that's 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 why i feel like this tomorrow right. yeah you know what i hey listen i i, I definitely wouldn't short you on the, the small and for that one that accomplishment that you guys were able to achieve given your numbers and your sizes that's actually awesome i'm gonna jump right into the next question here really and this is probably the one of the most important ones is you know what type of security concerns or standpoint should i look at or be concerned with on how my data gets migrated or stored into AWS. So one one more time for me here. So, I'm, so what from a security standpoint? Security standpoint. Okay, I'm, I'm, that's right. that's the word I missed. Yeah. Oh, okay. Missed. Yeah, it was getting a little choppy. It must be the weather here on the East Coast. Yeah. So I, I apologize if anybody's getting it. From a security standpoint, where should I be concerned with my data being migrated to AWS or stored in AWS? So, uh, you know, always worried about encryption and your, your encryption in flight is something that I'm not worried about with, um, you know, from, from the standpoint of getting data in there, you know, we're obviously uh, using SSL to, to get all that data into an S3 endpoint. Um, if you're moving to an EBS, an EBS volume, excuse me, I hope you're running over some type of VPN or you have some data transfer service that is being encrypted in flight. Uh, but once that data gets there, you know, it's it's still your responsibility as the customer to ensure that it's encrypted. Um, so, you know, default policy, they changed it, I think, back in July, right? The default policy now for S3 buckets is to be fully encrypted. Yes. I, think that's it. I think it is a, a default. But that used to not be the used to not be the case. Um, so just making, you know, validating that your encryption at rest is taken care of. Um, and then additionally, um, you know, making sure that your EBS volumes are encrypted. So if you take care of those things and make sure you know you're managing your keys well uh, with that, and you're not you know, throwing throwing anything around, uh, it's I am unconcerned with that security aspect. You know, the, from my understanding, uh, obviously, you know, I, I don't see the daily operations, but the GovCloud uh, data protection security policies for uh, for uh, hard drive disposal and uh, in, and the encryption of those file systems. Uh, are you know that's really followed throughout all of all of the AWS environments. So if it's good enough for the you know top secret level things going on in various governments around, uh, I think it's okay for my uh, my photos of my family. <laughs> those fax scan photos that you're talking about. Yes, it's, exactly. It's yeah. good and safe for those. 
Um, what Aaron's talking about also is the shared responsibility model that it touches on where you're responsible for the data that's in the cloud, but you know, AWS is responsible for of the cloud. So it is a shared responsibility there of you. And, and this is where AWS does step in and we enable certain features already kind of by default. Uh, everything's configurable by, you know, the end user, correct? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so you can you can go tweak and, and move things around how you want. And and uh, you know, as I pointed out, thankfully Amazon has just started to say, you know what, we're, this is just best practice. This yep. just put this on as default. If you're if you're if you want to turn it off, you're welcome to do that. Don't know why you'd want to, but um, when considering, uh, and I guess there's still a few people out there that think that um, encrypting your data at rest is just some tremendous IO, uh, IOPS hit to your to your data. When that's I think it's anything far from far from. Uh, being the case, you know, and that shared responsibility model, I think, really, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like uh, I just blindly go in with a trust of whatever Amazon tells tells us to do. I think it comes, you know, adopting these policies for every or nearly every organization I deal with uh, comes out of you know the the experience of having worked with Amazon and knowing why those policies come out. You know, the the S three encryption at rest probably should have been a default thing from the beginning. Maybe there was a reason way back when, that S3 was one of the very first services, right? Something from 2007. That, uh, uh, oh man, I want to do a pop quiz for you. No. <laughs> I got another one. <laughs> uh, the, the, by the way, it was 2006. Do you, no. know, when, do you know when S3 was launched? I, I imagine it, it had to be right around this time, right? Because it was right before the holiday season. It was launched on Pi Day. Oh, Pi Day. Oh, I yeah, that. yeah. So okay. I did a, pie a podcast with Mylon Thompson Bukovic, and what it was, it was my pop quiz to her, who is VP of storage. And <laughs> of course, I knew she got to get it right, yeah. but yeah. she told us the story on it uh, because it's been a back and forth thing every once in a while. Like, no, SQS was, and it, well, it was released on Pi Day. And what they do is everybody used oh. to bring in a pie on Pi Day to celebrate. Yeah. Uh, Amazon S3, so a little diverse there, digesting on that one. But anyway, no, that that's interesting. That's uh, I'm, I'm glad I was at least roughly close. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Off by a year. That's our. Right. <laughs> well, that's these, these days a year feels like nothing. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like 2020, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the uh, uh, so. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, so I was gonna say, so with that shared responsibility model, Amazon just sees so many different customers on a daily basis. They're, you know, while you know, we work with, as I said, we work with a lot of therapeutics companies, and while their science is different, the technology that they're running off of really isn't that different. Sure, science pipeline may be different, um, or you know, even our retail organizations, they they have very similar workloads. They're going to have very similar uh, infrastructure layout. Uh, the work that they're doing is different, but how the, what what allows them, what enables them to do that is is very uh, common. Center is and that shared responsibility model, the well architected uh, you know review or, or the well architected um, frameworks that have been presented. You know, following along with those things is how a company like PTP can do as much as we do as quickly as we do and compete against thirty thousand person consulting firms because. Amazon's done it with 500 customers before <laughs> and to the point where they said, let's go build a use case. Let's go make this a standard. And sure, you can go follow that standard or you can deviate a little bit from it. You can mold it to yourself. Yes, th those resources exist. And, and I just cannot stress enough for people to rely on those resources. Don't accept them for, you know, the, what is going to be the end all be all fix for you. Know what you're implementing. You know, always, always understand what you're implementing, but lean on those resources because they're going to accelerate your delivery of your uh, of, to your customers so much faster. Awesome. I'm going to bring us back around to some of those migration questions. Uh, I know we kind of get off a little bit on there, but this is a conversation between Aaron and I and really trying to bring you the best information that we have. And my next question is, how does PTP or someone approach a data migration project? How to approach a data migration project? An application so, migration, data migration. I've got all this data. How do we? How, how are we approaching it? Um, so there's yeah, there there are a lot of tools out there that you can use from Amazon, the server migration services to help you gather information on it. Uh, you know the, the well architected framework for a, a data migration will help you figure out 
you know, where you're heading. You've got the AWS calcu calculators to figure out costs. But, um, so, but that's a lot to take on for somebody that's just trying to jump into, uh, you know, moving a small, you know, maybe a rack in an IDF someplace in your, in your data center where the, you're saying, you know, we're just, we're just sick of maintaining this. We don't want to, I, I have a customer that literally, I, sw I swear to God, still has a VAX. Not, not FAX. VAX. Yep. <laughs> they have a micro VAX. Um, so, yeah, but they, they're like, you know, we obviously the, the VAX moving that's very difficult. You can still do it. Uh, but the, uh, but the X, you know, the XR, X86 architecture uh, equipment, let's just get it out of here. And that's, I think, the biggest, you know, the most common stuff you're going to see. So, you know, the, we partner, and Amazon's a great partner with a, a service called Cloud Chomp, uh, where you just run it up against your environment and say, look, hey, this is, um, you know, it will come back and say, this is what it's going to cost when you run there. This is how we're going to help you manage that migration. But I guess what, what that really does is it helps, uh, it does a, com a commoditization of all the AWS tools that sit in the background for really large migrations where you might be looking into figuring out some specific application silo or uh, that, that you want to move. If you're looking at more of a holistic view, just let's just get everything over. Uh, you know, there's there's tools like CloudChomp that will help out uh, with, with identifying those resources and then telling you what it's actually going to look and feel like once you're in Amazon. You know what's interesting? In part one, you talked about one of my partners. And in part two, CloudChomp is also my partner, by the way. No. I didn't know that. <laughs> you have the, you have both of them? Yeah, I have both of them. <laughs> it's a I don't want to say it's a small world, but it, it it goes around cloud management tools, which I deal with primarily, and they are one of my partners along with Cloud Checker that you called out. So. Well, and and you know, uh, it, you know what I was just saying about don't blindly follow Amazon's guidance, understand what things are, uh, you know, but the reality is you guys do so much and uh, you just, you know, you guys are just working at a scale that's, you know, just beyond what m most of them, really anybody else is going to see, I guess, I guess you as being the industry leader, you get to say, you get to be in that position. Um, you know, so finding, finding partners when we hear that Amazon is having a great uh, partnership with CloudChomp, we're going to try to be fast followers on those things. So. Yeah. Don't I, nice. I? If other people can do, if other people can do the, the, a lot of thinking for me, and then you know about you know is how, what's the fit from the business perspective, I'm happy to dig into it on the technical perspective. And Cloud Chomp's done a great job at uh, proving out their value. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. My my other question on that one: Does your approach or your plan change if it's a data database versus a data lake? A database versus a data lake, man. Oh, you you really filed the the spear on this one. Um, yeah. So, does my approach change for data lake versus for data just a data store? Um, yeah. I mean, you've got my my goal would be to get as much of a conversion into a data lake as absolutely possible. As, you know, mentioned Athena earlier. You know, let's just take. Let's let's take these tools that are generating these flat files that are sitting on standard block, that we're then doing an ETL on and importing into our you know Power BI platform or whatever the, the whatever the uh, the organization is using, and you know really in this very traditional uh, you know data centric data center centric uh, deployment. So you know I think the you know, the example is already here of, or has that already been mentioned of let's say you know forget it let's just get all that stuff into Athena and point Power BI at that. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's starting to get the foundations of it. So, and I think where people, where it becomes difficult to convince them to take on that type of approach of tr really desperately try to get towards a data lake with all of your, your uh, information is they don't tr feel that it's as fast as, it, as, you know, as their traditional, um, data stores are. And, and that method, I would say, you know, maybe, maybe let's have the, this, uh, um, the server of authority or the system of authority here, uh, system of record, be the data lake, and we're going to do exports and 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 we'll and we'll feed it into Aurora for you or something like that. So that that's where I really strongly try to push people to. However, uh, you know, there, you could have some high transaction application that you can't have that time for uh, going back and updating your data lake, where it, the uh, you know just may not have it may not may not have the read and write time to make that kind of transaction. You know, so a highly operational database, a data store. So yeah, you're going to have those that still sit in your traditional RDS Aurora, um, you know, uh, data stores. But yeah, definitely try to push people more 
for that data lake. And when you start talking about cost, I mean, if you can have that archive of a ton of data sitting on object, um, still accessible to your environment, maybe a little bit slower, or maybe you know how uh, than than a traditional um, you know Postgres database or something. But you know the, the cost might be of value, of, of enough of value, or, or the cost may be maybe worth it. I guess it's the, it might be the nicest way to do it. <laughs> I got a comment in the YouTube <laughs> chat. Nicest. That was just as funny because it's. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love when we can have some fun. You know, one of my questions was around network. It wasn't the very first question, which should be the first question asked. All right, I'm taking into consideration around my network of transferring my data there. Do, should I take in a consideration between the networks or the transfer between AWS availability zones and regions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the um, so when you start to use some of the, or when you start to follow along with the server migration framework for uh, you know identifying where data should live, where EBS volume should live, you know, make sure they're. You're not putting something in a different region or even uh, you know a different availability zone. Once you start making those those volumes, uh, you know you're you're going to be guided through that um, you know the location of it. But the reason that you need to be guided for that is transfer between availability zones can start to you know run up can run up your bill. Getting between regions absolutely can run up your bill. And you know my only criticism to Amazon, or I've got a few, but the only one I'll admit to on this uh, this is you know the the, the cost of our uh, data um, uh, to expiration. Yeah, that's the right word uh, of of your data uh, from Amazon is where you're going to get the co where the uh, costs are going to be incurred. You know you can get it in for free, but get it out costs you. So understanding your data flow and where that data is going to sit in the workflow. So that you can associate it to the the most cost effective for your SLA uh, service. So if you're going to need really fast disk access to, um, you know, like we we're thinking like uh, if you're, you have some operational data that needs to be really quickly accessed through traditional block methodology, yeah, you're not going to put a storage gateway out in front of S3. You're going to put an EBS volume out there. So getting your head around exactly what your data flow is and what your options are, EFS, EBS, S3, um, and then the other tools around that, like we, I think we mentioned last week, you know, putting CloudFront instead of in front of an S3 bucket to help reduce your uh, data uh, exfiltration costs. So those, those, you know, a, a lot, there's a lot to look at. It's, you know, it's a 20 dimensional Rubik's cube when you start to go into that. But if you follow along with those frame, frameworks, you know, you, you do end up in a, a, usually you end up in a really good position unless your business says everything has to be lightning fast. Uh, depends on who you talk to. Dev, dev environments need to be treated like production sometimes, you know, and so it it all depends. Yeah, it's, it's development is production to somebody, right? Yes, yes, exactly. You know, what's interesting is that uh, in part one of this, we kind of talked about AWS costs and in migration, what are we talking about? AWS costs or your cost in there. So they do go hand in hand. If you haven't caught part one, I did drop it in the chat. Make sure you do. Uh, I'm going to continue on here with some of the other questions that we have around there. Uh, one of them is, so Aaron, you've obviously had the chance to work with a great deal of customers on the verge of like migrations. Can you share an example or two with our audience where the analysis data that you provided helped them avoid some possible technical and budgetary pitfalls? Now we're back on cost. So technical yep. and budgetary pitfalls. So uh, a technical pitfall for... Um... Also, very large uh, uh, therapeutics organization here in the Boston area um, was looking to move. Jeez, oh, it was a absolutely. It, it was it was literally racks and racks of Isilon into AWS, uh, and they and and bringing it into S three, um, and we we started to do some trials. They said you know they they didn't want to do the snowmobile route. I was rooting for it, but they decided not to do the snowmobile. That's because you wanted to click the button. I wanted to click the button <laughs> and charge it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, and, then, like, and then pay somebody five bucks on the street. Say, just can you just go run over near that truck? I want to see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, so yeah, the um, yeah, they didn't they didn't want to go about that that path. So you know, as you're with with any good planning, you're going to try to put in as many trials as you can, you know, get some experimentation of 
of what things look like in there. And it actually worked out best for the, the company to put in two 10 gig direct connects. That was the most yeah. effective way for them to go through it because after what they realized after going through the, the migration test over the internet, they said, okay, that's not enough. Let's go put in one direct connect. We got one direct connect in and we ended up being two was that it's not just uh, it's not always about the migration that they that was gonna that they were worried about it was the access to that data once it was in the cloud so sure they can operate really really well in the cloud at really exceptional speeds but they still have a very large you know tens of thousands you know ten thousand uh, people uh, sitting in the boston area that need to get access to that data in some way shape or form and uh you know that so they they end up having to you know, with that, uh, by following along with that framework, doing a lot of experiments and really starting to understand what does this data life cycle really look like? It's not just ending up in a bucket someplace. It's ending up in a bucket and then being accessed by hundreds of people on a daily basis. We had to go and put in, uh, a, you know, a large uh, d uh, direct connect implementation too. Very, very, very large. 20 gigs feels like a lot of, sometimes feels like a lot of, a lot of data. I guess it all depends on that um, around that one. You mentioned a couple of things on on that. What are your thoughts around Amazon S3 intelligent tiering now that that's yeah. So going into uh, going right into uh, the the cost saving side of things here too. You know, I think those things go hand in hand. Um, so we we've been working with a lot of companies deploying storage gateway physical appliances out at sites to help uh, facilitate better communication between on-premise uh, data or data that was on-premise and getting into Amazon so that people can start to uh, work work on that, uh, work in the cloud instead of uh, on-prem. But, you know, so we set up a, we, I was asked, I guess probably once a week at this point as I'm setting up a new share for somebody, you know, what is the difference between standard and intelligent tier? And my, op my opinion is just do intelligent, <laughs> <laughs> please, for the love of God. Uh, let, it, again, going back to Amazon has done it so many times. And it's not that Amazon specifically has done it. It's that the 500 customers before you have gone through and keep on making the same type of request. Can I have a that says, let's move this data into this type of tiering? As I move, you know, let's move it to infrequent access. Let's move it to reduced redundancy. Let's you know, follow along with that, with that model. Um, and again, understand what in, in, uh, uh, intelligent tiering means for your data access, uh, your, you know, the, the life cycle of your data inside of your organization. But, you know, I think throwing, throwing a service out there where Amazon is literally saying, we want you to pay less. And just, and it's a, literally a pull down. It's literally a pull down saying, let me pay less. To me, it's just a, is an, is it a no brainer. Uh, and if, it, if, if it starts to fail, you just move it back to standard. Just move it back. And yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. I like intelligent tiering. I like the aspect of automatically saving money and not thinking about it. And it's like pennies. I mean, how could you not? Exactly. Yeah. As I said earlier, if somebody else can figure out the finance and the business side of it, that's it. I'm like, all right, you guys already figured out that it's cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. And and technically, there's such a little, you know, such a, a minute difference for the amount of, um, you know, for the for my my consumer's experience. It's, it's a no brainer. Uh, really, I'm right there with you on that one. So Aaron, as an architect who's been part of some significant migrations to AWS, can you share some of those stories and lessons learned the hard way and how to avoid them in the future when it comes around to data migration? Yeah, true story here. Uh, make sure you know how many data centers your company actually has. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 you gotta peel that back. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, came, I came in, I was told we had nine data centers. It turned out we had 11 in both of which were in different, the two missing ones were in different countries. <laughs> Wait, you said missing ones. Like, I mean, yeah. all right. I yeah. got I know I need to know more. <laughs> so, yeah, to... so again, know your environment. <laughs> it's a very first thing to do with any major migration. Uh, clearly, you know, that's why I was brought in was because nobody knew the environment. Um, but, you know, understanding really uh, what all of your customers, your, your internal customers, and you know, I try to break out in the consumers of your company. So your, your customers and your consumers uh, needs are, um, you know, this is just project planning 101 here is, you know, what do you actually need me to go do? Um, but I think where you're where it really starts to get interesting for us as as uh, cloud architects is. Starting to get your head around 
the uh, the application isolation. So you know, and I'll I'll take it back to a little bit what we talked about last week too with Control Tower and the and the uh, in the framework that Control Tower helps bring in for you. You know, if you start to follow that design pattern of uh, you know containing the blast radius of each one of your applications, so that could be either by business unit, by app, specific application, by product, uh, um, you know, so a, a grouping of applications. Um, you know, following that control tower architecture, uh, I think can really help you carve up your on-prem. So you're going to start grouping things, saying, "All right, well." We need network services. All right, here's my five network services. Let's go put those into one account, or maybe it's three in one account because they're so they're so tightly coupled, and two others uh, based on access roles. Um, you know, I, I, and when you start to do that, when you start to follow that 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 uh, application isolation uh, methodology and, and you know multi-account structure through organizations and control tower, um, you you start to be able to really. Uh, Communicate well to your business of what in, what is going to be impacted, and that and that's, that's for the migration standpoint. Uh, working with a, 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 a you know pretty large customer, you know several hundred thousand dollars a month, and uh, in in one account um, where they like well what you know how much does this product cost me? Like well we isolated the that that entire account is dedicated to that product, so whatever that bill is is what that is what that software cost for you. Like oh it's it's that simple? Yes, because we 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 created a discrete component that said, this is, this is all going to exist together and that's the bill for it. So um, it, it not only helps you with that, uh, you know, following along with that, that framework not only helps with identifying and doing and executing on the migration, but it'll help you in the business uh, world later too, with not just cost, but you know, failure or anything along those lines, and, you know, your, your operational issues that you can run into. I have to give a hand to uh, Gary or Ethan here who planned these part one, part two, because the first one was my AWS bill. And the second one is talking about what, what is that again, Aaron? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> data know. migration. <laughs> data migration. Okay. But notice how it goes hand in hand. We're talking about that cost and that migration and everything. We're bringing that back into the subject, into the conversation. So awesome job. I'm preparing that. Uh, for that one. This is good information here. I hope everybody's getting a lot of it. We got a couple more minutes. I got another question for you. You mentioned Storage Gateway. Mm -hmm. I, I think you need to go into that a little bit there. So AWS Storage Gateway, can I use that to migrate my data in real time, part time? What's so, what's so the to, case here? So to give you an idea of how much I push Storage Gateway, I can close my eyes and block my ears and just, I'm sure the words are, it's just going to fall out of my mouth because I say this so often that I'm just such an advocate for this product at this point. It has helped me out in so, so many ways. So Storage Gateway is, uh, you know, it's, it's an appliance provided by AWS as, um, you know, you can either get it a physical appliance, um, which uh, go look up the old school Google appliances and then look at the AWS appliance, buy it. They look so much alike. It's kind of weird. <laughs> um, um, so the uh, so the, there's a physical there's a physical appliance that you can go off and uh, and, and purchase uh, and it, it, it was a standalone device to to get product and get that AWS compute at, at your edge. We here at PTP we build our own uh, with along with a, a, a VMware hypervisor where we then run the appliance and we've got our own uh, reasons for doing that. We'll get into that here. But why we choose to deliver in that way is because we really want to have the variability of the types of storage that's available. Well, why do I need a whole bunch of variability in storage? Because, well, uh, Storage Gateway allows you to do file gateway. So uh, standard SIF, uh, Samba, file shares, volume gateway, where you're uh, doing iSCSI, and you also can do um, virtual tape library. So it gives you this, this flexibility to bring, um, you know, this block level or, or tape access into in, in on-prem, but then have that data automatically brought up and stuck to, stuck into AWS. So either through uh, volumes or uh, through uh, through S3 for how it's represented. So um, we use it a ton for like, as I was saying, you know, we with with everything that's been going on this year, we we still have uh, organizations that have data locked up in their facility or being generated by instrumentation in their facility, um, and they're saying, you know, I. You know, I don't want to be having to log in every night and run a robocopy job or an SCP to get the data out. So by delivering this appliance, it just 
programmatically shows up into S3. And when that thing gets filled up, S3 doesn't run out of space. Actually, I know I forgot to write down the amount. I have it. it so I, or I've got a great screenshot. It's of a Windows file share, and I want to say it's like 7.8 E. I'm like E, and I looked at it, so I had to go look it up. It's saying that there's 7.8 exabytes. <laughs> I think it was, yeah, it's exabytes. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's exabytes um, available for that volume. So sure, I don't have 7.8 uh, exabytes available in that little Dell, you know, 2U chassis. Um, but the fact that, I, that I'm that i backed with S3, that being able to, you know, move that data swiftly into Amazon and then being able to attach it to, you know, the compute resources up there has just been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and I, before the start of this, I was, I was asking you a question about uh, Storage Gateway 2. Uh, we actually have customers using it for virtual tape libraries as well. Yes, people still rely on tape. <laughs> I, I'm not even going to go there. First yeah. of all, it's the Storage Gateway uh, is a blessing to me. I come from the traditional data center background, and we had storage behind the nodes. It was a, I think it was a Dell or an IBM appliance, and it was, we had so many bottlenecks and latencies for databases, platinum level databases that need to be connected, that they would shut down websites and applications when the load got too high because they didn't have enough nodes. There was so much to manage. And the nodes were sitting there in the data center waiting to be racked for eight weeks and get in there. Uh, you're talking about storage gateway and unlimited capacity here for S3. You know, you just eliminated all the those issues. Yep. I mean, the only bottleneck you're going to potentially run into is if you don't allocate enough network to the transfer. Yeah, and and to, and also uh, if you're going to go with your you know DIY appliance as well, you know your correct your backplane that type of things, and 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 you know that's tuning. That's you know again knowing what your business needs. We had a customer that said, "Oh well, I my 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 very purpose built built storage platform that you know from a large you know three letter company uh, is is delivering seventy five megabits a second or megabytes per second." I'm like okay. What's what's our device that costs one fiftieth <laughs> that device uh, and has more storage in it? What's that one doing? Oh, it's doing sixty five. Okay, are is your are your customers impacted? No, <laughs> well, you, you you saved several hundred thousand dollars you know, because we knew we took the time to learn what what is the customer actually doing? You know, figuring out the, mm -hmm. the workflow of that data and for you know a. a crazy reduced cost for on-prem and then to have all that backup uh, and, and they're now doing science on that data in in uh, in AWS too so really a really cool thing I I have to I, I have two questions for you the one is about the appliance that you built yourself or use on yourself but don't go, don't answer that yeah. just yet there is a question or a comment dropped into the chat by your favorite person here uh, can you comment on blast radius? Ah, on blast radius. Yeah. So um, when, you know, part of what everybody that's ever worked in a data center uh, has, um, has experienced or logged into uh, an active directory domain and you go into that nice little group called administrator and you realize, oh, everybody in the company is an administrator. <laughs> uh, or, you know, I have enable access, you know, a junior engineer has enable access on the core switches. Uh, access just gets blindly granted because it is, you know, well, it's like uh, our back is like water. It will find the path of least resistance to be applied. So it's everybody ends up getting in. Everybody ends up being administrator. Yep. So uh, so what blast radius does with control uh, with um, a control tower deployment and that that model that you're uh, for that framework we're chasing after is even if somebody goes in and blindly starts giving administrator rights out. They're only going to be giving administrator rights out in that specific area. So if I went in and, and said, you know what, um, you know, we have an SO hooked up or we're, you know, our, our, um, you know, our, our active directory is hooked up, right? So any machine that's in that account, sure, Aaron gets a domain administrator on or he gets administrator on. Uh, but in another account, that's you know, and that's and I'm in finance, so my my finance tools, everybody can have administrator on it. But when you go to HR, they have a different a different section of uh, of uh, that of roles that are assigned there. So if somebody were to try to go out, the finance person breaks free 
and tries to go and blow up what's happening in HR, they can't uh, because you've contained the, the blast radius of what somebody could, uh, the damage that somebody could cause to your environment. But you go and throw a grenade into a traditional data center and everything's gone. So, <laughs> you know, why is it that somebody always, uh, Mr. Gary, always has to bring up those cowboys? <laughs> I got to ask this question because as much as it is improv and fun, with it, if they move their offensive line to AWS, will the Dallas Cowboys win another game this year? Let me check AWS Next Gen stats. Probability. 0.001%. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you never know what's going to happen on here. They, they can move their offensive line, but it's not the data. Because, All right. I got to get off of that top. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, I have, you know, my last question I had was, uh, I was going to ask about the pos how can we quickly move the data to AWS? There's snow cone, snowball, snowmobile, basically the snow, snow family. Yeah, snow cone is... Like the size of a book, right? Yeah, yeah. Did you, anybody see Jeff Barr and Bill Vass's video on that one of the the, the launch of it? I I, I must have because I, I I swear I can see like the orange box in my head. Oh, it was awesome. It, during this time, it was one of those uh, where I hand it to you, they grab it, and they're they're doing a live stream. It was a really cool event. So they did an awesome job with the video. But it's really cool that this device, if you get a chance, look it up in the um, AWS S3. It's the Snow family. Uh, it does follow the similar, you know, it's a hard, durable box. In fact, the whole thing gets shipped itself. It doesn't go inside a box. It is the box with the yeah. barcode and everything on there. Yes, it fits in my guess. It fits in his mailbox. That's where it does. That's <laughs> It's pretty cool. I just want to order one to go look. I got one now. Can I send it back? <laughs> you you have much more attainable goals. I don't think uh, you you can definitely order one of those. Nobody's gonna get mad at you. I think uh, my family might be a little weirded out if I have a snowmobile parked in the front yard. <laughs> Ooh, a snowmobile. Hmm. All right. Listen, listen. I, I'm putting it on my Christmas list. <laughs> like pull it up and deliver it out. That would be pretty cool. Listen, we have about three minutes left. Can you tell us about that device that you guys, or at least kind of get in there and why you built that for the migrations? Because we are talking about migrations and moving to AWS as well. Yep, so certainly. So uh, because of the, t the tiering that, um, so, uh, okay, so if you're going to be providing uh, a standard, we're going to go with File Gateway since it's by far the most common use case that we're, that we're running into. So File Gateway is just a SIF Samba share with, you know, exabytes of data uh, of uh, uh, backed up at S3. Uh, so when you go and you provision these things and you're provisioning your volume pools, you're setting up a specific cache on site. So you can go in, if you have 20 terabytes on site, uh, you, you, know, you, you can carve that up and say, all right, well, let's, you know, we're gonna give 10 terabytes to this virtual gateway so that that business unit will have, or that share, We'll have 10 terabytes backing it. Uh, and the reason that this gets important, so if you took multiple file file shares and put it onto one storage gateway where, you're, where your cash pool is of that 10 gigs, you could have one person end up having, because it's, it's first in, first, uh, well, it's uh, most frequent accessed files stay in cash on-prem, so you have speed. So you could have somebody go in and drop off 9.5 terabytes of data, thus evacuating everybody else out to S3 so that the pass through happens. So when, so, you know, if I go to get my big file and, you know, Johnny goes in there and blow and takes up all the space and I'm expecting really fast access to it, it's not sitting in the cache. I'm going to have to go out to S3 to go pick it up. So what we've decided, the reason we, uh, you know, big reason why we uh, have done this. And uh, if you guys steal this as a feature request, I'm sure Gary and Ethan are going to be pissed off at me <laughs> for not, for not uh, collecting royalties on it. Um, is that, uh, you know, so what we can say is, look, we, the other 10 terabytes are left over. Let's go give finance their own two terabytes and their own file share. Um, so and it's a way that we can go in and guarantee it. Now, the great thing is from the end user's experience, it all it all just looks like standard Windows file shares. There's no it's not like there's a big authentication difference. Everything is connected to Active Directory. You can be controlled through your standard OUs for, uh, um, you know, for, uh, for your grouping of everybody. Like all that stuff stays the same but we can guarantee that you are at least going to have several terabytes of data uh, associated to you. And you can imagine with our, with our therapeutics companies, sometimes they do a run and 
you know, we they'll they'll the one I was working with earlier uh, earlier this week was they put a hundred and thirty one gigabyte single file, and that's in one experiment, one result, and they can do this multiple times, dozens of times a day, so they can consume that space and start evacuating people's local cache. So that's why we've taken on that architecture. Um, over using the, the, the individual appliance. And then there's also RAID volume configuration, you know, a heavy and being able to go in and say, we need heavy write disks because the, the amount of instrument, uh, the instrumentation for you know, an IoT company we're working with, uh, you know, they might be generating so much data so fast um, that they need in, write intensive hard drives, all those things. Awesome. awesome. So we are out of time. Absolutely. I want to, I want to end this with a little bit of like uh, one, what are the, I don't know, top three things we should consider or top five, whatever you want to do. I know network's one of them. Absolutely. Uh, what are other things real quick you should consider? And then there's got to be like, I dropped in there, PTP's Twitter and LinkedIn. <laughs> Make sure you follow that one. Watch this a well. while. But Aaron, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, network, network, network all day long. Understand what your data life cycle truly is and what the actual requirements are. You know, we all remember that that uh, Active Directory administrator that wanted 250, 256 cores and two terabytes of memory and a petabyte of storage for their domain controller. Really try to understand and get, gather those requirements of, you know, what do you actually need? Is 10 megabits difference, uh, megabytes difference uh, going to be um, acceptable for your use case for your data transfer? understand that that pipeline and then follow along with the uh the uh the, the control tower well architected framework and, and blast radius and correct and trying to create that multi-account uh account structure if you can do those three things uh you know you're going to be able to get your data there fast you're going to be able to put it into the right location and make sure it's highly secure and uh the business will, will really uh be able to thrive from that I, I, first of all, you, if everybody noticed, we did not talk about the specific process of taking the data and moving it. We talked about the core features and the things that you should take under consideration. As you can see, Aaron and PTP have done this numerous times and deal with it, uh, you know, in a roundabout way, very methodical and know the business and the processes around it. Just don't go take and click and drag and drop your stuff into S3 and hopefully that you'll be able to access it. So, you know, we're, we're looking at it from a methodical process. I, I guess that's where I'm trying to get yeah, it. There's the niciest way. The niciest way to do it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And there's, uh, there's <laughs> definitely, uh, you know, I'm, there's a lot of great material out there provided directly from Amazon. And obviously the AWS community does a really great job at documenting those specific tools. But, um, you know, before you start worrying about the tool, start worrying about the job. Yeah. That, that sounds good. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, first of all, I appreciate everybody that joins and comments live and have some fun with this one. Aaron, PTP, thank you so much for sponsoring it, I guess, and, and reaching out to me. I always enjoy helping you guys out, working together. I think it's just a back and forth thing. It's pretty fun to have that conversation and do these type of events. I'm sure there's going to be some more here in the future. Well, I had the niciest time I could possibly have on a Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> nice nice awesome thank you everyone have yourself a good one great thanks john thanks everybody